That is the indication that it's time to begin our Bible study tonight. It is good to be in God's house. I'd like to welcome you uh, to Bible study in person. And those of you that are following online, I would like to welcome you also to the Bible study. Sister Berga, did you get something out of there? All right, very good. Brother Berga, sir, uh, would you please stand and pray over the Bible study and ask the Lord's blessings upon it tonight? Amen. Sister Sewell, can you get my glasses for me, please? All right, tonight, and thank you. I don't know why we're so loud up here, but it is what it is. How is it out there? Is it too loud? Just right? Okay. Tonight we're going to be continuing in chapter 9 of Isaiah, the book of the prophet Isaiah. And by the time we get to 8 verse, uh, eight, uh, the 8th verse of this chapter, chapter uh, 9 verse 8, the darkness of Israel and Judah was almost complete. Beginning in chapter 2, Isaiah catalogs the national sin that would usher God's judgment upon the nation. The first thing he categorizes is that of superstition or false worship. Spiritually, they made themselves like the other nations around them. That's not what God wanted. God wanted them to be a separate people. He continued with the sin of materialism. They became materialistic. And then, continuing on, they became arrogant, proud. They lacked good leadership. And then he begins to categorize social disintegration, which led to sensuality. <laughs> Yikes. Almost sounds like modern-day America. And alcoholism. The final years of Israel's monarchy were a period of political uncertainty. Kings like Shalom, who conspired against Zechariah, killed him and reigned a month in Samaria before being killed himself by Menahem. And Menahem reign lasted only 10 years. But while he was there, he led the nation further into idolatry, further away from God. which led to further demoralization and sin. Due to the ungodliness of its leaders, Israel in the north became a mixture of every conceivable practice of the Canaanites, the Assyrians, and Egyptians. In other words, uh, they forsook the worship of God and... Uh, they became a mixture of every conceivable practice, which included cultic prostitution to please the sexual appetites of the gods. The children were sacrificed to Moloch, the god of the Ammonites. And Judah, the southern kingdom, under the reign of Ahaz, began doing the same things. King Ahaz sacrificed his children this way, sacrificed them to the god Moloch, the god of the Ammonites. And Manasseh did the same thing. Both the northern kingdom of Israel and now the southern kingdom of Judah have rejected God's covenant 
and we're now traveling further down the road of rebellion against God. Rebellion may appear for a time to be fun, liberating. But rebellion opens the door through the law of sowing and reaping to ruin and ultimately damnation. Rebellion, God, God told uh, King Saul uh, through the prophet Samuel, he said, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. God, the sacrifices of God are a bo broken and a contrite heart. The sacrifices of God that God accepts really is that of, a, uh, of an obedient heart. All right? Tonight, we're going to be looking at verses 8 through uh, of chapter 9 through verse 4 of chapter 10. Beginning in verse 8 of chapter 9 and ending with the fourth verse of chapter 10, God, through the prophet, singles out four areas of the rebellion for rebuke from the Almighty. God is letting them know why God is doing what God is going to do. They are, number one, the sin of make-believe. <laughs> Yikes. The sin of make-believe. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 8 through 10 says, The Lord sent a word into Jacob, and it hath lighted upon Israel. And all the people shall know, even Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, that they are, that say in the pride and stoutness of heart, the bricks are fallen down. Yes, they are. But we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down. Yes, they are destroyed. <laughs> but we will change them into cedars. The sin of make-believe, brought on by a spirit of arrogance, is what we are looking at here. What they were saying, in essence, is uh, we're bigger and better than God. God tore it down, but we will rebuild it better. God, he had us only use bricks but we're going to use huge, huge, huge stones now. And our wood for framing used to be sycamore, but now we're going to use cedar. The significance of this is that those two materials were that usually that were set aside for uh, the palaces, um, the things of royalty. Arrogance says, who is God that we shall obey him? Pharaoh of Egypt had that problem. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? In Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, we learn really the attitude of mind that we as children of God should have. God, through this prophet Micah, said, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my, of, of my body for the sin of my soul? But then he goes on and says, no, God, God, God has showed me. God has showed thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee. You know, all God, all God is looking for today is a man or a woman who will do justly. And doing justly means what? You treat all men the same. You don't falsely accuse anybody. You don't believe a lie about them. 
You look at them through the eyes of God. To love mercy. Man, the Bible says if you want to have mercy, you must be merciful. And so to be merciful, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Not in arrogance. Not telling God, God, this is what you're going to do. You know, they want to they want to they want to tell you that it's okay uh well we'll just get into it because it's in it, this is in this is in the old testament this has happened before all right well, let's go on in their proud and pernicious ways they arrogantly ignored god's warning of invasion they expressed their determination to rebuild on even grander scale than before. They had forgotten already the song of degrees for Solomon that tells them, and by extension it tells us, it's still the same today, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord build the nation. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord shall keep the city. The watchman waketh in vain. You can have the largest army in the world. Pharaoh did. Pharaoh went out against what? An unarmed uh, people. And Pharaoh's army was destroyed in a moment of time. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh in vain. You can have all the mighty weapons, but, you know, if God is not on your side, uh, your weapons, now they may prevail for a while, and they may or may not. I'm not, you know, sometimes, sometimes, the reason why another nation wins in war uh, and they're both wicked is because one nation might be a little bit more wicked than the other. You know what I'm saying? And war oftentimes is God's judgment on nations. All right? And I know that, I know that these things are not popular. These things are, these topics are not popular, but you can't erase the past. I told my wife today, uh, they want to erase the past. And the reason why they want to erase the past is because there's truth in the past. There's truth there. Facts are facts. And facts are stubborn things. They don't change. And so what you have to do is you have to disappear the past. And that's what uh, Israel was doing. They were disappearing the, the past. You disappear the past by turning your back on God. That's how you disappear the past. Because in the beginning was what? In the beginning was God. In the beginning was God. Where did you come from? God created you. But if you undo the past, then you can fill in the blanks however you want to, you know what I'm saying? And, but... That doesn't work. There is really only one way that works, and it's God's way. God's way really works. And, you know, it could be said that if your life isn't working, try doing it God's way. You know what I'm saying? Try doing it God's way. And some people might say, well, I tried that. And, you know, the question that you might have to ask then is, well, how long did you try it? I tried it for one second, you know what I'm saying? A smidgen of time. I gave up too soon. <laughs> it's always too soon to quit, right? And so, well, let's go on. People build their lives on the sin of make-believe all the time. 
The end result, though, is the same every time. Judgment, failure, damnation. The truth of the matter is this. All of us are going to stand before God. There is coming a time when all of us are going to stand before God. We might as well get that through our head and make sure that we're able to stand the right way. You know what I'm saying? And, and so, uh, praise God. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The second area of the rebellion that warranted the rebuke of God was the sin of bad leadership. And what I mean by bad leadership is bad spiritual leadership. Leadership that doesn't lead the nation closer to God, but further away from God. And, and, and we're going to look at it right here. He said, for the people, verses 13 through 17 of chapter 9, for the people turn not to him that smited them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and rush in one day. <laughs> How quickly was the judgment of God going to fall? One day. One day it was over. The ancient and honorable, he is the head. And the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tail. For the leaders of this people caused them to err. Our leaders have caused us to err, teaching us that homosexuality is right, transgenderism is right, it's accepted. Why, they even let them pray. You know what I'm saying? Cause them to err, and they that are led by them are destroyed. The nation was destroyed not because of its people, but because of its leadership. From the preacher on down, the corrupt preacher. Now, Isaiah wasn't a corrupt preacher. But they looked at that man as what? As a traitor. They looked at him as uh, a tyrant, someone that was worthy of death. Why? Because he dared to tell them the truth. The truth is what they needed. The truth is what we need. Because we have to be able to stand before God. And there's only one way that we're going to be able to stand before him, and that is that we are clean. That is that we do what he tells us that we have to do in the word of God. Therefore the Lord will have no joy in their young men, neither will he have mercy on their fatherless and widows, for everyone is a hypocrite. Oh my goodness. And an evildoer. And every mouth speaketh folly. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. In these verses, both elders and prophets are singled out for, re for rebuke. This shows that all alike, the head and the tail, are rebellious against God. The leadership made themselves bad by not urging the nation to turn to God. They indeed were the ones that allowed the nation to become what it was. The third area of the rebellion that warranted the rebuke of God was the sin of disunity. The vision. Sowing discord for political gain. Manasseh, Ephraim, and Ephraim, Manasseh, verses, verse 21 of chapter 9, and they together shall be against Judah, one against the other, one citizen against the other. 
Who did that? It was again the leaders. Hmm. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Like a raging wildfire, the effects of their sin sweep through Israel, setting fire to everything in its path. In the ensuing confusion, the people turn upon each other. Disunity, turning against others, has always been part of the plan of the enemy of God's people. When the people of the nation fight each other, the nation retreats. Hearts grow harder, and God is forgotten. God is forgotten. And that really is the end game. The end game of communism, of socialism, is for us to forget God. And that's a fact. It's the truth. Because according to the communists, religion is the opiate of the masses. And then the fourth and final area of rebellion of God's people was that of the sin of injustice. Injustice. Woe to them that decree unrighteous decrees and that right grievousness which they have prescribed to turn aside the needy from judgment and to take away the right from the poor of my people. What right was the poor of their people? What right did the poor of God's people have? That's a question. Does anybody know? The answer? The poor of God's people have the right to prosper even as <laughs> the rich of God's people do. You know what I'm saying? But you see, the nation became something that God didn't want it to become. And one of the first things that happens in a nation that forsakes God is the poor are oppressed even more. They become poorer because they are the forgotten ones. Because the political leaders are all about their money, their power. And that was the way that it was back. This is what God is saying. You know what I'm saying? Again, we need to know the past because the past has a lot of truth in it. You know what I'm saying? Well, let's go on. Now, please forget, I'm still working on this jaw thing, man. This jaw, I got this whatever. It's, it's kind of, you know. To turn aside the needy from judgment and to take away the right from the poor of my people that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. Keep them in a state of oppression. Legalized wrongs of governments are some things that God hates. Ancient Israel is, at the time of Isaiah's prophecy, no different from our own modern society, where the murder of innocent unborn children has been legalized by government. I just read today where our federal government is going to allow our tax dollars to be sent again around the world for abortion in other countries. Something that had been stopped. Homosexuality and other sins that are against Humanity as God meant it to be are given credibility. Given credibility. Why? 
of a positive legislation. Our society, too, must face the dreadful question. Now this, <laughs> I, right here, I am quoting from something that was written many years ago. Our society, too, must face the dreadful question found in Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 3. And what will we do in the day of visitation and in the desolation which shall come from far? To whom will we flee for help? When we turn our back on God, when we get to the point where God can't help us because uh, in our pride, uh, we, we, we won't humble ourselves. You know what I'm saying? And I'm, I'm speaking nationally. And the reason why we won't humble ourselves is because, well, you know, the God of the Christians, uh, that, uh, you know, that, you know, we can't do that because that will leave this group out over here or that group out over there. You know what I'm saying? Well, the God of the Christian, who is he? He is the true and the living God. He is the only one that's God. Now, if that group over there is serving an idol, I don't have to follow his ways. His way, I, in fact, I don't even need to, you know, I could teach my children, hey, you know, you, you know what, they, what they believe is not right. And that's not, that's not wrong to teach them that. Because God told Israel, you make sure you tell your children about me. You know what I'm saying? Tell your children about me. Because it is in me and in me only do you have eternal life. You know what I'm saying? Jesus is the only one who died for us, took our place in death, was buried in our place, and rose triumphant on the third day. Muhammad is still in the grave. Muhammad, you know, they, they're, from what I've been told where his grave is, they, they have some horses ready for him when he comes up out of the grave. Now, he's coming up out of the grave when Jesus tells him to come up. You know what I'm saying? I know, I'm just being controversial here, I guess. Since when is telling the truth controversial? Only in, you know, sinful uh, America, I guess. All right. Man. Israel of old sowed to the wind. Now they are reaping the whirlwind of God's judgment. In conclusion tonight, man, well, this was pretty good timing. Israel and much of Judah had forsaken the Lord. Ahead lay the certainty of judgment. The enemy was already threatening at the borders. There was no escaping it. And they were unprepared for it. And the reason why they were unprepared for it is because they didn't see it. Why, they made peace with their enemies, so to speak. You can't make peace with your enemy. There's only one way that you can make peace with your enemy. You either join them or you defeat them. You know what I'm saying? You either surrender to them or you have them surrender to you. You have to decide who, uh, whose way is better, you know what I'm saying, when you're, when, you're, when you're fighting an enemy, you know what I'm saying? And that's, that's just that's, that's the truth. I'm saying at the risk of repeating himself Isaiah cannot help but point to Jesus as the only hope for them lay in God's promised child Jesus the light of the world it is in his light that we find what we're looking for, and only in his light. You know, I'm glad that tonight 
God, God still offers the light. He still offers himself. We're here tonight as a testimony to the fact that God is still reaching out to fallen man. Now, there's coming a day, and I don't know when it is, but there's coming a day when we will be taken from the earth. We will be taken. Jesus is going to come in the clouds of glory to catch his children away, to take the church out, to take the church. And now, you know, uh, who is the church? The church that Jesus is coming back for are who? Right, the born again, those that have been baptized, placed into his body. Remember, remember the Bible says that many are going to say in that day, Lord, Lord, did not we prophesy in your name? Didn't we preach in your name? Didn't we cast out devils in your name? He's, but, but he's going to say what? Depart from me. I never knew you. You didn't do the will of God. You did your own thing. You did what you wanted to do. You didn't serve me. I, I wanted you to go over there, but you said, I'm going over here. You know what I'm saying? They that do the will of God are the ones that abide forever. And so, and again, that goes back to Micah, walking humbly with the Lord our God, walking humbly with our God, walking humbly before him. And sometimes that humbly walking before him is hard. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard because, man, you have all these grandiose ideas. You have all these, and God says, hold on, buddy. Hold on, buddy. But, 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 but God, man, I'm, I'm like a rocket ship. I was getting ready to take off. They, they, they started, they, they've already started the, the ignition process, you know, and, that, and you can see it, man, it's starting to shake. God, I'm ready to go. But God says, hold on. I remember Pastor Davis uh, talking to a man one time uh, who Pastor believed was called to be a teacher and not a preacher. But the man didn't want to teach. He wanted to preach. And so Pastor said, okay, well, we'll, we'll let you. And so after years and years and years of going out and preaching and not really he finally got to the place where the man finally got to the place where he said, I think God wants me to teach. You know what I'm saying? He got the preach out of him. He got, he got really his will. He surrendered his will to God's will. And, um, and so, I mean, that's a struggle. You know what I'm saying? That's a fight. That really is. You know, walking humbly before God, man, it, it's like uh, sometimes, man, God, I, you know, and then, and then you get all frustrated and whatever because things aren't going the way you think they ought to be going. But, but God's in control. God knows what he's doing. All right? And maybe that's, what, maybe that's the lesson that God's trying to teach us is that uh, he really is God. And we really can trust him. We can trust him with our life. If God told me to sit down right there. I got in trouble one time because I was told to do something, and I did it. I followed all the way to the very end. And when I got called, I said, well, uh, sir, I didn't do it because I was told not to do it. So I, I, I said, sir, next time, next time something like this comes, comes up, would you want me to call you and ask you if I should do this? And I'm not, I'm not getting into any details of it. It was just he, because, because I, you know, the last thing I was told to do was just wait. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so I did. I waited. I waited. It's not something I wanted to do. I wanted to let everybody know. But I was told to wait. And so I did. And I got called on the carpet. Huh. But my, my answer when I got called on the carpet was, this is what I was told to do. And so they couldn't say anything about it. You know what I'm saying? Nobody could say anything about it because uh, I was only doing what I was told to do. You know what I'm saying? And so, 
And sometimes that's hard. That's hard. It's hard. But, but, when we do it God's way, it works. It really does. It works. And thank God today, thank God today, that we really can do it God's way. God doesn't make it hard. What did Jesus say? Brother Vasquez, what did he say? Jesus said what? Come unto me, all ye that uh, are heavy laden, labor and are heavy laden. He said, learn of me. He said, for I am meek and lowly. You know what I'm saying? God's ways are not hard. Now they, they can become hard because, man, like I said, man, we're all we're ready to go. You know what I'm saying? And don't, don't ever lose that, but at the same time, like, like David, he said, shall I go up or shall I not go up? God said, you go down and you wait. Go down. And when you hear the rustling in the mulberry trees, then you go up. You know what I'm saying? There's a time. There's a time to wait, and then there's a time to go. Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the glimpse that you give us of the past. God, that we might learn from it and become wise Help us to understand completely and entirely, God. God, that your word is truth. No matter what man does, no matter what man says is right, your word is still the same today as it was when it was first penned. You're the same, God. You are he that is the same today, yesterday, and forever. You do not change. Your standard does not change. And just because man says it's okay doesn't make it okay uh, in you and before you. And we will answer for our own sin. God, we ask that you would help us to walk humbly before you. And especially as these days, God, in these days uh, where uh, it seems like we are being div divided and there is a lot of discord that's being sown a lot of untruths that are being uh, taught as truth God help us God to walk humbly before you and to trust only you God for your word is truth and your word is eternal and your word is the source of eternal life have your way in our hearts our souls our homes our families our mothers, our fathers, our sisters, our brothers, our community. God, we need you now more than we've ever needed you before. God, have your way. Help us as a church. Help us as a community, as a people to love one another, to walk humbly before you, and to share the glorious gospel message of a loving and caring Savior who died for the whole world. Accomplish your will in our hearts and our lives. In the wonderful and glorious name of Jesus, we pray these things for your glory. Amen and amen. Are there any questions tonight? There will be a prayer meeting tonight for those of you that would like to stay and pray with us. There will be prayer meeting. Uh, we are in the process. We're in the process of, of updating our database, changing the whole system. Um, 